You're watching Jazz Night in America. I'm Patrick Jaron Watsonana. This episode features a saxophonist who's played with Wayne Shorter and Gerald Wilson, but also Snoop Dogg, Lauren Hill, Flying Lotus, and most recently, Kendrick Lamar. His name is Kamasi Washington, and he's got a new album out called The Epic. It features a large band of phenomenal musicians, and most of them go way back. When I met all these guys, they pretty much knew that they wanted to be musicians as teenagers. You know, some people don't know. They kind of just doing it, and if it takes them, there, you know. But these guys knew, just as well as myself. I knew that this is pretty much what I wanted to do when I was 14 years old. That type of attitude. It, that's what. That's what drove us together when we were young. It's like me. We've been cultivating our sound for since we were kids. Since we were like 13 years old, we always kind of went outside the box. You know what I mean? We were never. We were never uh, conformists. It was around the high school era that you know, it, it, it all kind of came together. We all played with each other. We, all, we, we, we were all each other's favorite musicians. I, I think something happened where our skill set caught up to our relationships with one another. And to be able to move so fluidly throughout music without having to do a lot of talking, you knew that there was something special there. It's like we've, like, done some stuff together, not just musical stuff, like been through trials and tribulations, had friends that have passed away, had to bail each other out of jail or whatever, like pay each other's parking fines or lend each other money. So, you know, we're not just, we're not just musicians, we're also great friends, you know, we're also people that just go hang out together, listen to music or whatever, play Street Fighter or, or you know, play basketball or whatever it is. West Coast Get Down is Ronald Bruner, Brandon Coleman, Stephen Bruner, aka Thundercat, Kamasi Washington, Cameron Graves, Patrice Quinn, Miles Mosley, Ryan Porter, and Tony Austin. Despite their individual careers, they all make it a point to play together nearly every week. A few years ago, they realized there was strength in numbers, not just for making music, but also for renting a recording studio. So I had this idea of a record I wanted to do. I wanted to like record a band and have them be really free and then write large ensemble arrangements around that band, you know? So I started calling all, all the guys in the West Coast Get Down. Um, I said, you know, telling them I, I need about three or four days. Miles, I, and Kamasi came up with the idea like, like, well, you know what, if we pull our resources together money-wise, maybe we can get enough money to, to rent out a spot, like a real nice recording studio for a month. Everyone that I called was like, man, I got some music I need to record too. And so we were like, all right, well, let's just, let's just really commit to this. And we're just going to like shut down the West Coast, get down for the public for a whole month. You know, Miles was really organized. So he had this really great schedule for us that started at 10 o'clock in the morning and ended at 2 every day. And that's just what we did. So really, we were just all committed to helping each other succeed because we know how special and, and and uh, needed our voice, our voices are in, in today's music, you know, atmosphere. Time is money, man, and everybody wanted their time, you know. But we, you know, it didn't feel like that. I don't know. I don't know any other group of musicians that I would be able to do that with. It worked because, you know, you help out your friend. You help out your friend as a musician, not just because he's going to help you out, but because you want to see him succeed. So that's how we made six records and tracked a hundred and. 30, 120 something songs in 30 days. It was, it was fantastic. I walked away personally with 45 songs to try to make a record with. I reduced the 45 to 17 that I felt like there's nothing I want to change about these songs. Nothing. They're exactly what, the way I want them to be. Those 17 songs make up a massive three disc album called The Epic. We recorded the album release party in Los Angeles over four hours of music. Here are a few of our favorite moments from that night.
Wow. Wow. All I'm going to say is, wow, y'all so beautiful. Wow. Wow. Thank y'all so much for being here. I see so many faces I know. Thank you all so being. Thank you all so much for being here. We're going to play something for y'all now.
So, I want to tell you guys something. I'm going to have my friend Paul Cartwright help me out. You can dim the lights a little bit. Dim the lights a little bit. So, uh, a lot of people ask me, like, um, you know, what made you put out a three album, three disc album? So when I was working on this music, I started having this dream. <laughs> it sounds crazy, right? So I just wanted to tell you I part of the dream that made this album what it is. Is that cool? So the dream starts off like this. There's a guard. I had it like 10 times, had this dream like 10 times. There was a guard in front of a gate. He doesn't do anything but guard the gate, nothing. He has no family, he has no friends, he has no home, he has no possessions, all he does is guard this gate. He doesn't do anything else. The gate is at the top of a huge mountain, like bigger than Mount Everest. From the bottom of the, of the mountain, you can't even see the gate. And at the bottom of this mountain, there's a village. And there's all these people that live in the village. And all the people in the village do is train every day, all day, to be able to challenge this guard so they can become the guard, so they can guard the gate. That's all they cared about. That's all he cared about. So one day, four young warriors come up, and they challenge the guard. The first one's super fast, like faster than anything you can ever imagine. But the guard beats him anyway. The second one is super strong but the guard beats him anyway. The third one is fast and strong, but the guard beats him anyway. And the fourth one is faster and stronger than any of the other three, but the guard could still beat him and he sees openings where he could take him out, but he sees something special in him. He sees a spirit or like a power or something that he, he knows that's in himself as well. And so he has this thought that he never had before, that he didn't have to be the guard anymore. He can, let, he can let this young man be the guard. So he makes a decision, and he opens himself up and lets the young man basically take his life. The gates open, and these people come and drag him into the gate. And just as he's about to go in the gate, he opens his eyes, and you realize that none of that happened. He was just dreaming. He had been sitting on some stairs watching these young kids train in the village and just imagining that one day one of them was going to come and take his place. So then the dream would flash forward 10 years and those kids that he actually was watching, they actually were now at the level where they were going to go challenge the guard and they were going up the mountain to come meet him. And uh, they get up to the top of the mountain and the guard is gone. He's not there and the gate is destroyed. And like their whole lives are like crashing because that's all they ever did. All they ever thought about was coming and challenging this guard. And that's the plan. So stick around.
you know, music music changed my life. You know, um, you know, I was headed towards a different kind of path at a certain point in my life. You know, I mean, I was a little gangster. You know, every other word was cuz, and I, you know, I was, you know, I've got one, I was a tagger, and I, I had full plans on like getting put on six zero and being like this thug. Like my friends, you know, we 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 we, we jacked people, and <laughs> you know, they they had brothers and sisters and cousins that sold drugs, and you know, so you just. Those, it sounds crazy, but like those were our, our aspirations. And around that exact same time, my cousin gave me a tape with Art Blakey on it. And it was just like the whirlwind of all that. Like one, Art Blakey kind of felt like NWA. It, it felt gangster, it felt hood. It felt like something that my friends would like if they knew about it. <laughs> so I was like showing them about, telling them about Art Blakey and like showing them, you know, giving, uh, letting everybody borrow my tape. And like all of a sudden all these little hood kids from 74th Street School were like into Art Blakey, he was like, the thing at my school, crazy enough, you know, like all of a sudden I wasn't hanging out with any of my friends. All I wanted to do was play music and just, you know read and 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 learn. You know, my mom thought I was having a depression or something like that. Like she actually like got a psychologist to come to the house and like, so come on, see, are you sad? And I was like, no, nah, I'm cool. I'm just listening to this Cannonball Adderley record, you know what I mean? <laughs> and she was like, oh, okay, you like Cannonball Adderley? So that, by the end, of the end of the little meeting, we were just talking about jazz, me and this, this psychologist, you know? Um, but so so then, you know, as I really got into music, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted my music to change the world. I wanted my music to, I want my music to have a voice to people, you know? <laughs>
my oldest son, my first son, Masi, my second son, taught him to play piano. And when Masi came around, I didn't, I didn't have any energy left to teach anyone. So around 12, he said, I want to play. I looked at him, I said, do I got to do this? I had him sing a Charlie Parker solo. I said, when you, if you can sing this solo, I'll teach you. So on so forth. You know, as a as a Charlie Parker tune. So if you can if you could sing a Charlie Parker tune, and you can sing the solo, your ear is in tune to the music because you got to move to that music. And when he could do that, then I knew. So we started from there. So um, Masi realizes that I made a sacrifice teaching music so that I wouldn't have to go on the road, when, you know. So he's been very, very, very kind, and uh, I'm included. Yeah. I'd like to bring, up, bring back uh, two very special people. OG, triple OG, Ricky Washington. <laughs> and Patrice Quinn. We're gonna do a song that I wrote for my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother was, uh, she was about four feet tall, you know, not college educated. You know, she struggled with, you know what I mean, ailments of, of sorts. But throughout all that, you know, Everybody in my family, at least my father's side of the family, would lean on her, you know? I mean, she raised three sons, you know, a lawyer, a, a Irwin Washington, the, you know, Irwin, yeah, 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 the, 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 the mind behind the Little Washington Dance Theater, and my dad, Ricky Washington, a world renowned human sister. Also, she had grandsons who've gone all over the world, you know what I mean? It's just, all these big, strong men who've been college educated and, you know, I mean, have all these fa 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 with <laughs> lean on this little four foot year tall woman, you know what I mean? She helped all of her sons buy their first homes, gave me my first car, gave my brother his first car. I think my dad was driving her car for a minute, too. <laughs> you know? You know? I mean, uh, Henrietta, Henrietta was a very powerful woman, and uh, she was inspiring. So I wrote a song for her. It's called Henrietta, Our Hero.
You know, you go anywhere, or like what jazz scene in LA? There's, you know, but being born and raised in Los Angeles, you know, I've always, you know, I've always known about, uh, you know, my jazz roots and and just about jazz and just the scene and where the cats go. Um, but there is a big jazz scene in LA. You know, it's just unfortunately, it's just not as big and elaborate as New York. Talking to a lot of people, they always want to know where is the jazz at. You know, and I'm always like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> because you know, to a certain degree, it's like, it's like, you know, we are like the last, to me, like the last, uh, how do I say this, man, without stepping on anybody's toes? I was going to say, just, we're like the last lions of, like, L.A., you know? Actually, I say the last, the last lions because it's something that we do that I haven't seen anybody else do. And I go travel around the world, and I'm like, okay, which is what makes it so much special, which is why I say that, you know? Because it's something that we do when we take that stage, and it transcends. And I've, I haven't heard any band do what we do, so uh, I take that back. The Beatles are pretty fucking dope.
I met Ronald when I was, I guess I was three years old. I had a birthday party. I was at his birthday party, and he's a year older than me, and and he was turning, you know, three. I was turning two, but I was definitely there. And my dad got me a drum set, and I never get like, cause you know I was three, so like I, I felt like I was a little kid, not a baby. Ronald was like one, one and a half, almost two, I think maybe something like that. He could play the drums like better than me. I just remember this baby that could play the drums. And I was like, how can this baby, like he couldn't talk really, but he could play the drums. And I was like, this is crazy. I came out the womb playing drums. So I definitely was there on some drum, whatever, <laughs> whatever drum set was around. I came out like that. It kind of like messed me up a little bit. Like I was like a little bit, you know, mad because he's at my birthday party and he could play. Baby was playing the drums better than I could, you know. He wasn't no drummer. He just was a boom, pap, boom, pap. Oh, this sucks. He wasn't. <laughs> he front, man. He front, Kamasi dude, really. You know, just blow that big metal bent tube and you'll be fine, man. <laughs> This is a journey into music and sound. Watch out and get ready to move your feet wherever you are.
so much. Y'all stayed the whole night. I love y'all for that. I really, 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 really do. Don't forget, the album's on iTunes now. You can go home and download it. You can go upstairs and buy it. Yeah, I see somebody already got there. Take this music home with you. Put your phones out. Let's bring jazz back on a higher level. I've been here already did that. But let's do it again.